Hello everybody, welcome to this anaphylaxis campaign webinar, which as you know is one of a series that we've been holding. Um, today's webinar is the role of cleaning in the management of allergens and our presenter today is Peter Littleton. I'll introduce Peter. I have known him many years, over the 12 years since I joined the anaphylaxis campaign. He's been a great friend to us. And in fact, when I joined the campaign, the, one of the first things that happened was he took me on a tour of food factories uh, in the Midlands. And I'll never forget those visits to sandwich factories and sausage factories. And they really, really opened my eyes as someone who'd been in the NHS, but never had contact in that way with the food industry. So that really cemented our friendship, I think. Um, Peter's technical director at Chris Danes, um, and it's Europe, Europe's only family owned multinational specialist cleaning supplier to the food industry. Peter's had a 30 year career uh, involved with the food industry, and he's always had a key interest in training. And as someone who has been uh, involved with his training programs over the years, uh, many of you will know what a fantastic communicator and trainer uh, he is. Um, as I say, he supported us in many different ways different ways and we're delighted to have him to speak to us today and it's great this webinar has been very significantly oversubscribed so we're we're thrilled to bits peter has also produced a paper to go with this webinar which i can tell you is is really excellent and what we'll be doing is that the webinar will go out through all our channels twitter facebook on our website the actual presentation that Peter gives will be available to our corporate members and this uh, paper, which he has produced, will also be available to our corporate members, as will the Q&A. Um, we've had a number of questions in already for Peter, and after the presentation, I will be asking him some of those. Do keep your questions coming in because as I say, they will form part of the Q&A and we'll make sure that we get the answers from Peter to all of your questions. So without further ado, I will hand over to Peter. Fantastic, thank you for that fantastic introduction, Lynn. And, and I'm afraid folks, it's it's all downhill from here. That was that was, that was the peak, so. Um, well, good afternoon and, and thank you to, to Lynn and, the, and the, the fantastic team at the campaign for Give me the opportunity to uh, to share some experience on on the role of cleaning in in the management of allergens, um, and I'll uh, I'll crack straight in so we maximise the amount of time at the end for for questions because I know we we have quite a few. So things we're going to be talking about uh, in this this brief hour we have together um, a little bit on on the industry, um, what is cleaning, what can it achieve with regard to allergen management. What does clean look like from the perspective of allergens? And also we're going to talk a little at the end about disinfection, but but not a lot about disinfection. And that may give you a clue to uh, to the role it plays. But first I have to uh, do a little sing for my supper. So I'll get through this bit fairly quickly. As, as Lynn says, I'm technical director for Christine's Food Hygiene here in the UK. Um, we are uh, an applied chemistry supplier and hygiene support. So we've over a thousand employees worldwide with subsidiaries in 30 com countries. Um, and as Lynn said, we are privately owned um, by, a, by a family in, in Belgium. Um, so we are also the second largest supplier of, of paracetic acid, which is a, a key disinfection in, or disinfectant, I should say, in, in CIP and also in open plant cleaning. Um, but at heart, we're, we're a family of, of, of experts um, who are committed to ensuring that our customers get the best available service that, that we can. Um, as you'd expect from a, a large supplier, we supply the uh, services and the products to monitor, undertake and train for, for hygiene. And we do have a, a very good training brochure on our, our website 
um, that lists not only the face-to-face -face training, a lot of which is is via these mediums with remote in these very strange and unusual times, um, but also quite an extensive e-learning catalog, which does include uh, training courses on, on allergens um, from operative supervisor right up to management of allergen levels. As I say, we, we are operating across predominantly um, Europe in terms of food, but we also have subsidiaries in, in South America. We have a factory in Brazil, um, but our, our key um, food supply is, is across, uh, across Europe. And there's so, some of our customers. Marvellous. Right, we got through that bit. Good. I won't get in trouble with my sales director now. So, a bit about the industry. Um, the food, food industry can be quite a, a, a complex I'm just going to minimize my windows because it's right, my window is right over my text. There we go. Um, food processing, manufacturing and service sector can include quite complex processes and equipment. And this equipment is often designed to achieve a specific objective. And that will be efficient processing, um, ease of engineering. And sometimes it's designed to be hygienic, um, but often equipment can be modified, can be old, can be traditional. Um, and the fabrication can just make hygienic design sometimes quite uh, quite challenging, which gives us a, a, a problem when it comes to particularly allergen and allergen removal. Cleaning can also take place throughout the production day um, with a more detailed clean occurring regularly, routinely at, at night. Um, on our, our brief tour, um, when I took Lynn and showed her the, the highlights of the of the food industry, we, we, we stuck to daytime. Um, I decided not to inflict a, a nighttime hygiene shift onto, onto Lynn. Um, we'll save that one for, a, for another day. Um, but certainly during the production day, cleaning can take place by a, a wide range of methods and by a, a range of, of personnel as well. Some of the equipment we may find uh, in our factories and in our shops and in our food service and restaurants, um, from conveyors, through waste scales, uh, through lazy Susans, which are the rotating turntables, through to food service counters, ovens, saws, shelves, racking, uh, conveyors. It's a whole plethora of, of, of equipment, um, some of which can be fairly straightforward to clean. Tables, for example, are, are fairly easy. When you get to things like the meat slicer in the bottom left of your screen, that can be, if anybody's ever had to dismantle one of those, quite a complex task to actually get to the nuts and bolts and to ensure that all of the food contact surfaces are suitably cleaned and disinfected. So, allergen control and cleaning. All right. First thing to consider is that the cleanability matters. By this, I mean the factors that will actually affect the uh, removal of the allergen. That can be the form of the allergen. So if you think about, let's focus on, let's go milk. So if you have a solid uh, milk derived product, so for example, a pat of butter, if you put it on a surface, by and large, it will stay pretty much where it is and will just sort of sit there and look at you. If it's liquid milk, it will be a bit more free form and a bit more flowing. So it will flow over a surface um, and will spread to a wider area. And if it's, for example, whey powder, so milk powder, that will become airborne and it can potentially be spread over a far larger surface area. So when you're considering cleaning with allergens, you first thing to start with is what form of the allergen am I, am I dealing with and what can I do to keep it in that form? So if it's a solid, the best thing you can do is keep it as a solid when you remove it um, rather than letting it spread into either a liquid or, a, or a, um, airborne droplets airborne dust. The porosity and texture of the surface can be, can be uh, important. We'll cover that in a bit more in a few moments. That will often dictate the cleaning method that can be used. And that's also linked to the materials of construction. So going um, down the list, easiest to clean, top of the tree, stainless steel. If you've got stainless steel equipment, it is pretty easy to clean, uh, both from a chemical application point of view and from a uh, surface porosity and a surface finish point of view. It's nice, it's smooth, it's easy to clean. Um, and if you've got that, fantastic. You may have aluminium, um, which again, should be fairly, fairly smooth, um, fairly easy to clean. A little bit more restrictive in terms of, of chemicals you can use, um, but you can still clean that fairly, fairly easily. 
Hard plastic, a little more difficult. Again, chemically wise, we've got to be very careful that we don't um, corrode and, and uh, cause stress fracturing of the plastic, which means we can end up with scoring, which if we've got little scores and damage to the surface, harborage can take place, so we, it becomes more difficult to remove that allergen. Then we get soft plastic and rubber. These can be quite, quite complex. Um, you can get uh, folding, you can get trapment areas, and you can get debris, um, particularly allergenic debris, building up inside the, the folds and inside the, 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 uh, the actual housing of the rubber. Often as well, the soft plastic and rubber will be, will be fitting into something. So there'll be a recess behind it, which debris has an, an uncanny habit of getting into. And then right at the bottom, most difficult to, to deal with in terms of, of allergen cleaning are cloth and for wood. So you may think we don't have a lot of that, but you'd be surprised the number of places where we come across cloth conveyor belts, uh, particularly in the baking, baking industry and bakeries, um, where cloth may be used to, to, uh, as a conveyor material for, for the dough um, or for the finished products on occasions. And cleaning those um, in situ can be quite difficult. Um, I've stood in many bakeries and gone, right, to clean that belt, we need to take it off. And, and somebody looks at me as if I've just sprouted an extra head and gone mad because the belts are very, very difficult to both remove, clean, and then an absolute nightmare to get back into place. So you need to think about the, the, the cleanability um, of the surface that we are dealing with. There's been quite a bit of work published in this in this area. Um, there's eHedge, which is the European Hygienic Engineering Design Group, which has produced a, a series of guidelines. Um, that's actually the third edition on screen there. There is a, a, a fourth edition. Um, I think it's about to be published. Um, and there's a there's a UK chapter for eHedge and there's a chapter across Europe. Um, this is a, a, an idea where a group of, of professionals who have got together and put together the hygienic design principles for equipment. So trapment areas, try and make things as easy to clean as possible. Um, I'm not going to cover too much methods of detection uh, in this in this webinar. Richard, Richard Field and my colleague uh, covered that admirably um, a couple of weeks ago. But there's also a, a very good guideline. Um, it's a few years old now. Um, 2009, I was involved with this guideline. 2009 doesn't feel that long ago, um, but it's just occurred to me that it was 11 years ago. Um, so it's a uh, yeah, it's um, possibly one in, in in due for for a bit of a bit of a revamp. And I believe there's work already going on that. But guideline 59 talks about validation of cleaning to remove allergens. I'm predominantly in this short time we have together focusing on the physicality of actually removing the allergens and, and the role that cleaning plays, not really going to be delving into, into validation, verification or testing. As I say, Richard covered that, um, but there will be a brief slide on it on a bit later. So cleaning methods. Um, we can start with, with the good old basics. Uh, manual, which can be with a bucket, with a, a brush or a, often a green pad or a disposable wipe. We'll cover all these in a bit more detail in a moment. And in the wider industry, we may use foam or a gel clean where we actually apply the detergent from a, a pressure gun, um, usually low to medium pressure. These days we very rarely see um, uh, sort of high pressure. And then we have automated cleans, whether it be CIP, tray wash, rack washes, or increasingly we're seeing robotic cleaners being brought in to, to help clean up, uh, clean up our food factories. So for manual cleaning, um, there's very little you can clean or you cannot clean with a, with a manual application. Get a good old bucket, a brush, a load of solutions, some cloths, and, and you can pretty much clean anything. You may have access difficulties. It will take some time, but it's all achievable. Key factors in that cleaning process are diligence of the operative actually carrying out the clean, the attention to detail, making sure you're using the right cleaning equipment, the right detergent, um, both the right type, the right concentration, and the right temperature, because um, it's certain that, that uh, warm um, detergent solutions are, are more effective at removing um, the debris that's housing the allergen. Because don't forget, you haven't got, just got the allergenic protein on its own sat on the surface. It will be held in a, in a food matrix, um, often bound up with fats and oils. So that gives you a clue as to how we can talk to, look at removing them as we get into chemistry in a few minutes. You need the time to clean. 
you know, often people can, can rush the cleaning process and it takes time to do that job properly. And again, the design of the equipment, as I've already mentioned, eHedge, uh, making sure you uh, you don't have the trap areas and the and the the, the, um, the nooks and crannies, and then diligence of the operatives. And yes, it's definitely in there twice. Um, the diligence of the operative in a manual clean is essential. If you if you have that, you've got a very good chance of getting a, a good, clean, um, effective surface. If you haven't got that, then it can be very very difficult, and the standards will slip. For foam or gel cleaning, as I mentioned, this is where you, you fire a detergent from a, a lance uh, towards the surface and cover it in, in either a foam or a gel. If you think about the, um, the car washes you, you may go to locally, or at least went to locally before uh, uh, last Thursday when lockdown kicked in again, um, this is where you'd, you'd pull in and, and the guys would spray your car down for you and, and use the, the pressure guns. So it's a lot quicker. It's a lot more effective at covering large surface areas with, with detergent very quickly. Again, diligence is key there, as is attention to detail, the correct concentration of the detergent, and then some manual agitation. So if you think about even the car washes, when they, they foam down your car, they'll, they'll dance all over your car with a, with a, um, with a, a uh, sponge or a, um, a, a chamois and levy uh, a mitt in order to, to loosen that debris and remove it. Then they'll rinse it and then you've got the visual inspection. So when you're thinking about cleaning in, in a food premises, it's the same as cleaning in any other scenario. It's about the removal of that debris and the effective attention that you pay. Tray washes, if you're in a, engaged in a, in a food and manufacturing operation, these will be very familiar to you. Um, they're for the automatic cleaning of the often thousands of product trays that we have in the industry. And as you can see on the graphic there, you feed the tray in at one end, there's a pre-rinse, that stage may be missing, but sometimes you may find a pre-rinse, then a detergent stage where the, the detergent will be sprayed over the, um, sprayed over the tray as it passes through, a rinse phase, then a disinfectant phase, and then drying occasionally. Sometimes these first two, these first and last sections can be missing, and you'll just get detergent rinse, disinfect, and then dry as it comes out. Um, but ideally, you'd have those those five chambers. The concern can be carryover um, from one product to another, so from tray to tray. So if you're manufacturing a product that contains egg, and then putting trays through that don't contain egg, would you get egg being carried back onto the surface? As you can see, each of these are a separate distinct um, volumes of, of liquid. You can get a wearing over from the rinse water into the detergent and the detergent into the pre-rinse. As long as the, the, the rinse is actually clean, then the, the risks of carryover is very much reduced. And uh, again, there's a lot more detail on that in the, in the white paper that, uh, that Lynn has described earlier. CIP is a, is a particularly specialist area, um, so it's commonly used in dairy, brewing, beverages, and increasingly now in ready meals. Um, again, concern is carryover from one product to another. But again, it's the val proper validation and operation of that. And the system shown on the screen there is a very, very simple uh, CIP system um, that would basically pump liquid through the, the, the plate heat exchanger here, and there's a mixing, ves mixing vessel at this point. So you may get a pre-rinse, a detergent clean, a rinse, and then the disinfectant stage. If you go into larger um, dairies, for example, or um, beverage operations, you will have kilometers of pipe work that both the product flows through and that the cleaning liquor will flow through. It's where you'll have a, a feed pump, spray ball for the large mixing vessels, and these can be anywhere up to 15, 20, 30,000 liters in capacity so large operations and then pipe work where you get a flow of liquid through to to clean the total loss and this is a recovery system where if you see the differences there we've got one tank with the detergent and disinfectant being pumped in so everything goes straight to drain hence total loss with the cip system you have tanks for well, rinse recovery detergent and clean water with the disinfectant being injected. So here you actually recover a lot of the liquor. So again, the validation and verification of this is essential to ensure you don't get carryover of debris into your detergent tank. To be fair, even if you do, 
the dilution rate is going to be high because these, again, tanks can be five to 10,000 liters in volume. So a little bit of organic protein going isn't a major problem as long as it's not then being redistributed and the rinse cycle is, is working correctly. In terms of detergents, we break them down into three flavors. Uh, there's the neutral detergents. So if you want to get a good neutral detergent, grab a bottle of foam liquid. Um, you work by emulsifying the fats and oils. So if you think about the way that washing up at home works, you squirt your fairy liquid in and all the, all the debris is collected up from the surface and suspended in the water. Um, so neutral detergents are really, really good for manual cleaning, particularly in, in food operations, because they're also safer for the operatives to, to handle. Um, and often we include a biocide um, to, to affect the, the microbiological um, standard of the of the surface when you deal with any contaminants there we then move on to alkaline detergents these work by saponification um, which is a great word if you can get scrabble that in scrabble you can get lots of points from that um, but saponification is a process where you turn fats and oils into soap so if you ever spilt any um, uh, alkaline chemical on your fingers or, or um, bleach which is also a alkaline base on your fingers and felt it go a little bit foamy that's actually turning the skin in your, in your hands to, to soap. So that can be applied manually by foam or in solution as a recirculation. So again, if you're breaking up the, the debris, you're breaking the fats and oils, you're enabling the, um, the soiling on the surface to be easily rinsed away. We have a, a, another phrase on there. So we break alkalines into two categories. There's the straight alkaline chemicals, and then we have a, a slightly in a way made up term which is caustic technically it's highly alkaline but the caustic detergents you will often find in cip sets in tray and rack washing a lot more aggressive um, often ph up to about 14 um, very very good at um, saponifying fats and oils and, and removing debris um, but also present additional hazards to the operatives and if you open your, your kitchen cupboards um, you will have chemicals that fit into that category. Um, the the, uh, the big um, proprietary brand, probably shouldn't name them, of, of oven cleaners, um, starts in Mr., um, is, is caustic based. And if you read the um, instructions for use on that, it's, it's quite clear that you need to handle that with a great degree of caution because it will um, affect the, the fats and the oils and the, and the skin um, on yourself just as well as it will affect the debris on a surface. Then we get to acids, so right at the bottom there, so in the, down in the, in the browns, so down around the pH of one to twos, um, very little uh, in the way of cleaning potential, so it won't really affect fats and oils a great deal, but incredibly useful for removing mineral scale. So if you, I, I live in Derbyshire, so if I draw a line east of me over to Norfolk and, and the east coast, um, we have an increasing problem with, with mineral scale, calcium carbonate deposits. If I draw a line west of me towards Wales, um, obviously not crossing into there at the moment, but over to the Welsh coast, we tend to get softer water um, where, where we don't get so much in the terms of, of mineral scale. But acids are also very good for protein removal. They hydrolyze the proteins and, and remove those. But often, if you're thinking about allergens, although they are proteins, it's not protein um, on its own. As I say, it's often bound up with, with the fats and oils. So utilization of neutral and alkaline detergents is often the best way to go for removing the, the food debris and, and taking the, the allergen with it. A few common problems and how to avoid them. Um, common problems, I've already mentioned a few of these. Trap points, so joints, conveyors, hard to reach areas. You know, if you look at, a, at any piece of, of food handling equipment and think, hey, am I going to get to that bit? That's the trap point. That's the difficult area to get to in order to actually effectively clean it and clean it properly. Um, we'll talk about how to resolve some of these in a moment. Um, insufficient time. So if we don't have enough time to carry out the clean properly. So if it's rushed, the end of the shift, um, we're trying to change products. Um, this can also be a bit of a challenge sometimes in, in food service where you've got multiple out, um, allergens handled um, for, for all the covers that are in um, with small um, and limited contact areas. So having time to clean between the two can be, can be quite a challenge and needs to be done quite diligently. 
insufficient training um this one really is a key um we need to make sure that anybody who's handling um or involved with with allergens and with cleaning um understands completely what they are doing and quite um specifically what the consequences of failure could be they need to understand why they're doing it and what can happen if they get it wrong uh, that then feeds back to the attention to detail and also to the diligence that I mentioned very much at the at the start of this. And then the use of wrong equipment or, of, or the wrong chemicals. Um, wrong equipment more so if you've got um, if you're using brushes or if you're using scrapers or scourers um, and, and they can actually act as, a, as an accumulant for, for allergens. Often people will have uh, specific color coding equipment for, for allergens. And the question is often asked, okay, what, what color you got for allergens? Oh, purple, great. For which allergen? All of them. Okay, well, do you clean that cleaning equipment? Because if you don't clean that cleaning equipment, you can actually end up having more allergen in the trapped in the, in the, the bristles and in the parts of the brush than you may actually end up with on the surface. So it can actually act as a spreader for, for, for allergens rather than as a, a remover. So equipment and cleaning equipment needs to be handled very, very carefully. So engineer out the trap points, look at those difficult to reach areas, look at where you've got difficulty in accessing and actually engineer out um, those, those, those points. Obviously without causing further problems, we're not talking about just covering them over, but make it so that, for example, conveyors are multi-sectional so that they can be easily lifted away and taken away. Um, allow time for the cleans to make sure that you've got sufficient time to carry out the cleaning between products or between shifts training i've majored on already but make sure that people are trained trained and train again too often we see allergen awareness being built into the induction training in in plants um, which is is great and is a, is a time to do it but it also needs to be teased out as a specific food safety control because often we find that out the induction is 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 done in a day um, it may not be effective um, if you think if you're taken into a room, sat, uh, sat down and bombarded with information during the day, how much of it you actually retain during that day can be limited. So specific training and retraining and refresher training. I've known companies that have run allergen awareness weeks where they've, where they've um, challenged the canteen, for example, to do um, allergen free or allergen Lay, lay light meals so i shouldn't use the word allergen free with the lemon on the line but actually yeah so do gluten-free meals do dairy-free um, meals just to ensure that that people are understanding and continue to understand why this is important look at the new equipment and make sure it's evaluated sometimes it can be a case of the first time a hygiene team see something a new piece of manufacturing kit a new piece of equipment is when it turns up um you know it should be evaluated for its allergen cleaning ability so go back to the clean ability we looked at at the start of this to make sure that it can actually be cleaned effectively and clean thoroughly attention to detail again that links into to the training making sure that people are understanding um, exactly why attention to detail is is so necessary and provide adequate dedicated equipment make sure you've got sufficient uh, cleaning equipment and cleaning chemicals to be able to carry out the task. Ensure the hygiene equipment, crucially this one, is it is self-cleaned after use. Too often somebody will use a piece of equipment, a squeegee or a brush to clean something up and then just put it away again. It needs to actually be cleaned itself. Otherwise, as I've already described, it could become a, a, an accumulant area and then start to become a, a, a cross-contact and cross-transfer route itself and check, inspect, and verification testing. Uh, the last of those points verification was, was where Richard was, was talking on a previous webinar, but checking and inspecting is something we can all do. Um, you know, looking, just as simple as looking at the surface, does it look clean? Can you see debris there? If there's debris there, it will need to be recleaned. You know, that is the crucial first step, and that's something we can all do very quickly and very easily. That may need getting a torch, we need to get a torch, but that's fine. It may need bending down. That's fine as well. You know, look at the return rollers on conveyors, not just the top of the surface, because if the bottom roller has been missed, that could then spread allergen contaminants onto the, the conveyor as it goes through. 
as I said, mentioned several times, I'd like to be Richard up. Um, his excellent webinar um, earlier in the series was was fantastic. But if I didn't mention the basic techniques, I'd, I'd be remiss. So Richard talked about validation. So there was ELISA testing, which is laboratory based. But there's also verification testing, which is often antibody based. Um, and it is either in lateral flow or, or flow through formats. These tests are really useful for quick verification of food in food surface cleaning uh, and can be readily used in, in factories and food service of, um, areas. Key things to remember with them is follow the instructions, make sure that they're, they're, they're stored correctly and also read the results within a few minutes. Um, you can sometimes get false positives um, if you if you leave particularly the, the lateral flow devices for too long, because as it progresses across in chromatography, it can then hit the end and bounce back. So read them. I've had numerous occasions where panic technical managers have phoned me at nine, 10 o'clock in the morning going, we've got a positive hit for allergens on our line from the night before or from last night. Right. When was the test taken? Five o'clock in the morning. Right. What did the hygiene manager say? It was clear. Great. It probably was. It most likely was. Because if you're looking at it now, it could have suffered from bounce back. Um, so you need to make sure that you use these um, these tools in exactly the way that they are described. And just as a as a as a sort of a, a cautionary note, um, be very careful if you're using DNA analysis for allergen testing, because with DNA analysis, you're not looking for the right material. You're looking for the DNA, not the allergenic protein. Whereas in ELISA and antibody testing, we are actually looking for the reactive protein or one of the proteins in the in the mix. Whereas DNA, you know, you may well um, may well struggle to, uh, to to discern between what's product and what's allergen containing. For, to give you a good example, if you've got chicken in your product, you wouldn't be using DNA to see if you've got egg present, because obviously the DNA would be the same. So you need to be quite careful with, with DNA analysis to make sure that you're using it properly and effectively. Another thing that's widely used in, in the food manufacturing sector, and we're seeing a lot more in, in food service as well for quick tests, is ATP, adenosine triphosphate. Um, it's an excellent non-specific hygiene monitoring system, and it's the same technology that gives um, the glow to a, to a little firefly friend there. In, in the bottom of the court, bottom of the screen. Um, ATP is widely av available through all living cells. In fact, if it's not in a living cell, it's not living. Um, all living e organisms contain ATP. But it's not of much use in allergen management as allergenic proteins aren't, are not alive themselves. They will have come from a living cell, but they aren't actually alive themselves. And I've seen instances where a low ATP level doesn't necessarily equate to low protein levels, particularly in a processed food and in processed samples, only low levels of living or recently deceased cells. Now, if you've got a high ATP level, then yep, you will definitely have proteins present and potentially allergenic proteins present. But a low ATP level does not necessarily equate to a low protein level. Um, you're not looking at the same thing. It's like going into a retailer and, and trying to decide how many bananas they've got by counting the apples. You're not, you're not comparing like with like. ATP, though, as I've said, is an excellent non-specific hygiene monitoring system, and it has a, a really um, important role to play in monitoring of hygiene in, in all food premises. Um, but you've got to use the right test and understand the information that the test is giving you in order to ensure that you're getting the, the, the information you need to manage that uh, cleaning process properly and effectively and talk to your um, machine suppliers. Um, you know, there's some really good um, uh, ATP units out there. There's some really good allergen testing kit out there. So talk to the, um, to the people who know about these things and make sure the system you, you are using has been stress check checked to ensure it's giving you the right information and also giving you useful and usable information. Because with information, we can control the uh, potential cross contact of allergens from one product to another. Now, disinfectants. So we clean, we disinfect, two very different and distinct processes. Sometimes we use the two processes alongside each other or combined into a one, one stage clean, which is often called a sanitizer. 
but that contains both detergent and disinfectant properties. So the role disinfectants play in allergen management is, is nice and simple. They don't. Allergens don't actually materially affect or are affected by disinfectants. So they aren't alive, they're protein strands, so you cannot kill them. Um, numerous occasions I've had people say to me, I need, I need a chemical, chemical to kill an allergen. No, that's not what we're trying to do. Okay, so disinfectants don't have a material role to play in inactivating allergens. Of course, the fact that you're flowing liquid across the surface may assist with displacing any remaining food debris or proteins that, that are present on a food contact surface. But chemically, they have very little um, act activity to play. There is some laboratory evidence to show that some oxidizing disinfectants, so things like sodium hypochlorite, better known as bleach, um, hydrogen peroxide, proacetic acids, can um, denature and break, up, break apart protein strands. However, remember on the surface, we're not dealing with pure protein strands. We're dealing with a complex food matrix that may involve fats, oils, carbohydrates, other, other components, fibers. Um, so we're not just accessing the, 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 um, the protein itself. And believing that disinfectants can inactivate allergens can actually be quite dangerous because that can then engender in the operative a thought that maybe, well, well it doesn't matter, I'm going to disinfect it. You know, it doesn't matter if there's a little bit left on the surface, it'll knock it out. It's not, not the case. So that's where we need to be quite careful in how we um, explain the role of disinfectants in, in allergen management. So allergen cross-contamination, allergen cross-contact between product runs or between product recipes is all about the clean. It's about cleaning effectively, diligently, and carefully, and then disinfecting afterwards to remove any remaining bacteria, or as we're all increasingly worried about, viruses. But uh, this virus hasn't been shown to be food transferred sorry, transferred across there. So it's about that clean in the totality. It's about the time, it's about the diligence, it's about the detergent used, and it's about the equipment that you use to carry it out. And if you use, if you apply that jigsaw correctly, you will achieve effective management of allergens through the application of, of cleaning. Um, and that, I think, pulls me to the end of the presentation. So... I said I'd try and target about 40 minutes, Lynn, and it looks like I've just about made it. So we now have plenty of time, I hope, for, for questions. Thank you very much, Peter, for that excellent, excellent presentation. Um, as I said earlier, the, this webinar will be available generally on our website, um, but the Q&A and your excellent paper that accompany uh, this webinar together with the actual slides will be available to corporate members of the anaphylaxis campaign. So thank you so much for that. We have had a number of questions, as I'm sure you can imagine. Some of the points actually <laughs> looking at them, you, you have picked up, I think, during the presentation. But nonetheless, because people have actually been asking them, I'm, go I'm going to ask you to reiterate the points because I think uh, particularly some of them are do bear repeating. So the first one, actually, you did talk quite clearly about in the presentation, but I think it's worth reiterating. And this question um, came in prior to the presentation, and it was, do disinfectants have a role to play in relation to allergens? And I know this is something you feel very <laughs> strongly about. No, they, they, no they, they won't. Because an allergen isn't, isn't alive, um, we can't kill it. Um, and the whole role of, of disinfectants is to, is, to, to, is to kill or inactivate, um, kill bacteria um, and to inactivate viruses. So no, as, as I say, the fact you've got a flow of liquid um, across the surface may help to displace any remaining sort of, you know, fragments of, of food debris. But in terms of the actual material um, interaction between or of disinfectants on allergen proteins, no, it, it, it's about the clean. Okay. And the next one, again, quite a basic question, but I think <laughs> extremely important one 
is hot or cold water more effective to removing allergen residues? It depends very much on the clean and on the surface. Um, in the main, a hot or warm detergent solution will be better at um, getting the, the debris and the, surf and the um, food residue into solution and, and away and will chemically act a lot more quickly. You can get away with cold, uh, cold cleaning, but you need to supplement that with additional physical energy. So, for example, in a... Um, in, when we when we do a foam clean, because we include compressed air, there's no point in having hot water because it just cools the compressed air down, the foam down as soon as it hits the the, the surface. And we're also often working in factories at, as you found when we went round, eight to twelve degrees. So you're you're dealing with a cold environment. Um, but there we have longer contact times, slightly more aggressive chemicals, and we increase the amount of, of physical energy. But if you're dealing with a um, a, a surface where you're cleaning manually, um, then hand hot and warm is, is definitely better at removing debris than, than cold. Yeah, I mean, one of my abiding memories of going round factories is the temperature of the, the buildings and also uh, being sort of wrapped up in big cloaks and wellingtons and hats and masks and just about everything else. And because I'm vertically challenged, 10 times too big for me, which caused much amusement to everybody. But I think uh, it's, ve it's very interesting that people who aren't involved with food manufacture, and we find this a lot when we deal with questions on our helpline, people aren't aware just how complex and how seriously the food industry do take cleaning and the processes in involved. Um, the next one, um, on a slightly different tack, is it a legal requirement to have a written cleaning regime for allergens? It's not a legal requirement, no. It is best practice and it's a requirement in every uh, third party code of practice on, on food safety I've, I've ever read. So from GFSI, BRC, any of the retailers, um, they will all require written cleaning schedules um, because it's far more effective um, to be able to train somebody against a, a, a properly documented procedure than it is to, to, to try and have somebody just do it. The, the basic legal requirement is that food um, contact surfaces must be cleaned and when necessary disinfected. But it's not a legal requirement to have a document, um, a documented cleaning procedure. But if you look at the even as basic as the um, Safer Food Better Business Pack from Food Standards Agency, that advocates the use of, of cleaning instruction methodology in as a method for both standardizing and for training individuals. That was a lovely clear answer. Thank you, Peter. The next one can we use the same regime? for microbial and allergen cleaning? Quite probably, but it would need to be validated and verified. As a general rule of thumb, if a uh, clean has been able to achieve a, a microbiologically clean surface, then it will probably achieve a, a, an allergenic free one as well. The only caveat to that is that to achieve a microbiologically clean surface, you're using a disinfectant and if you think back to the very first question you asked me and the answer to that, the disinfectant won't affect the allergen. So you will still need to um, test the and validate and verify that the food contact surface has been free for, or has been uh, effectively decontaminated from a, an allergen ro residue point of view. But gem generally, yes, a good, um, well carried out microbiological clean will also achieve a, an allergen uh, clean surface. The next one slightly controversial, and it's what it touches on a topic that we feel incredibly strongly about at the anaphylaxis campaign. Um, so I'm glad that this question has come in. And it is, we have older equipment that is difficult to clean and to swab. Is it inevitable that we will have to use PALS, the culinary allergen labeling, on our product? Or is there anything else we can do 
to reduce the risk of cross-contamination between runs. Okay, looking at the clock, we've got 15 minutes, haven't we? <laughs> <laughs> We may not get to the rest of the questions, Lynn. Um, yeah. I know where you're coming from this year. In terms of, of PAL labelling and, and may contain labels, um, I, I, I will always recall the, the look of sheer horror on your and Hazel's face um, when, he, when a lady was standing at the front of a presentation saying how she regarded the, the, the may contain labels in different ways and indicating different severities. And I could see you gradually, the color draining from your face as you had to explain to her that, yeah, may contain labeling is is, is difficult. Um, older equipment is difficult to, to, to clean. Um, not so much, I'm not so much worried about the, the, the swabbing side on, on this one, but certainly on the cleaning side, the more aged, uh, the more um, broken, uh, the more damaged the equipment is the more harborage points you've got, not just from a, an allergen point of view, but also from a microbiological bacterial point of view. So older equipment is more difficult to clean. I wouldn't necessarily agree with it being inevitable that you'd have to use may contain. I think may contain or product uh, precautionary allergen labeling um, has a place, but only as a last resort. Uh, too often we I've seen it being used as a well we handle it therefore we'll put it on um, and I've seen it on you know, made in a factory which also contains and the allergen could be handled you know, hun, you know a couple of hundred meters away in a completely different room but technically it's in the same factory so therefore a, a pair pal is put on to say handled in a factory which also handles nuts for example um, it, it's not helpful to the to the allergenic consumer um, it's it's nice and comforting and easy and helps the technical manager sleep at night often to think, well, we'll just tickle down and label on and that's that's fine. But it's not helpful. Um, and I, I'm firmly of a belief that if something is so old and so difficult to clean that you cannot effectively decontaminate it from an allergen point of view, then you're potentially going to have microbiological issues as well. Um, in which case it, it's high time to look at that equipment and think it's probably done its done its service. It's done its time with us. It may be time to, re to replace that. So no, I don't think it's inevitable. I do think it should be the very last thing that, that we put onto our packs um, rather than, may I say, controversially being lazy and go, well, we'll give it a quad bulb over and then we'll put a pal on it, which nobody does, I hasten to add. But that's that's... It's not a it's not a straightforward as saying it's old, it can't be cleaned. Some old equipment can be cleaned very, very effectively because it's simple. Yeah, you know, some of the challenges we're finding now with new equipment to spin the question round, um, particularly when we're starting to look at robotics, is a lot of them are using um, vacuum suckers to pick things up and move them around. And that then introduces a cleaning problem. There's a lot of sensors, there's a lot of conveyors, there's a lot of automatic uh, transfer of equipment. And some of those things can be quite difficult to, to clean. So just because it's old, like me, doesn't mean it can't be cleaned. Um, which there's no, I'm afraid, clear cut and dried answer to that, apart from validate the clean, verify the clean, and only use PALS where it's absolutely necessary. Which I think, if I remember rightly, fits in nicely with the campaign yeah you're nodding good <laughs> and we do have a future webinar coming up on precautionary labeling as well because as you say peter it's a it's a topic that merits a whole webinar but thank you for uh, that answer which i think is spot on um here's one that fits in with the current time in which we find ourselves <laughs> Um, are hand sanitizers effective in removing allergens? No. Nice clear answer. Great, great for bacteria, great for viruses if they're antiviral. Um, but in terms of, of removing, um, the, 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 the clue is in the question. Um, you know, hand washing is, is the most effective method for removing allergens and other contaminants, including bacteria and viruses from the hands and then a hand sanitizer afterwards. And the next one, how often should we swab and test to validate our cleaning regime? 
again, if I return back to third party standards, um, they will often require a validation process once a year. Um, and generally you'll validate a clean on three occasions. So you'll clean it, you'll test it, you'll clean it, you'll test it, you'll clean it, you'll test it, and then take the average across those three, because as many of your, your, your attendees will know if they're, they're involved in factories, you go into a factory, you start looking around and poking your nose in, and people change their behavior. So you do it on three occasions to remove the randomizing factors, and that's your annual validation. So that's will the process work. And this is where validation, verification, and monitoring are used, which we explain more in the paper, but are designed as distinct terms. So validation is, will the cleaning process work? Verification is, has it worked? And, ver and monitoring is, did it happen? So the oh. records. So validation in testing terms would be things like ELISA testing, which is a lab-based test. Verification would be the lateral flows or even the ATP testing, bearing in mind what I said about ATP, but it's still a verification test. So did it work on this occasion? And then monitoring is the documentation to say it's happened. So validation, I would say at least on an annual basis, or if you change the process or, or product mix, you introduce new recipes. Thank you, Peter. And I know having read the paper, there's a clear, very clear exposition of that um, in, in the paper itself, where it clearly sets that out. But thank you for explaining that. And the next one, um, th these sorts of questions are always quite tricky to answer, but um, I will ask you it. Which training courses would you recommend? There's a whole range of, of training courses out there. As I mentioned right at the start of the thing when I was doing my, uh, my sing for the supper bit, um, Christine's have them. Um, other, other chemical suppliers have them. Other organizations have them. The anaphylaxis campaign has their own range of, of, of excellent training courses and training materials. Um, the FSA has training um, and organizations like Camden and Soft. So it's really looking at your training partner of choice but it's more about the level and the um, deployment of that training rather than which specific courses. So for example, what is uh, highly relevant for a technical manager won't necessarily be relevant for an operative on the line. So for line operatives, you're looking to get the basic understanding over of the rate of the risks from allergens. So one of the ways I've found very effectively to do that is, is to stick your white coat and boots on Lynn and, and hightail it into the factory and, and, and get the line together and talk to the people on the line. You know, and, and none of this fancy PowerPoint and slides and graphics and things, you just do it au naturel. And it's, it's a lot more effective because you're fully immersed in their world and you can point out real world examples. I've not just done this with allergen training, but also with, with listeria training. Um, very, very effectively in, in chilled food factories. Um, the other great part is if you get line one together and ask them to tell you what's, what line two are doing wrong, they cannot wait to tell you what line two are doing wrong. <laughs> and that, and they, by that, they learn. And then you, you're, you, can under, you can explain and show, look, you've got you know, this, this tray of product coming through this way. You know, if you go into the spice room or if you go into the mixing room, you can say, well, look, you know, we've got a cloud of dust in here. What is that dust? Well, it smells like spice. You know, is there an allergen control component there? Is there a mustard component? Is there a, a whey powder? And it's, it makes it real. You then move on to the supervisor's line leaders, and that's about explaining and getting the understanding that um, you know, what the risks are from, from allergens, what the risk to the consumers, and also relate it back to the risk to the business. Too often we focus on, well, this is the risk to consumers and, and making that nebulous leap from risk to consumer to risk to my job can be quite difficult. So if you can tie those two together and explain that, look, if, 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 we, have a pro if we cause a problem, it could close this factory down or close this restaurant down or close this food premises down. That can cause a, a challenge. Step up to the technical managers. That's where you start to get into the validation, verification, ELISA, testing, role of ATP, precautionary allergen labeling, the whole stuff that you know, we've, we've gambled through uh, cleaning very, very quickly here. Normally we would take three to four hours 
on on cleaning and where it fits into allergen management. You know, we've condensed it very much into a into an hour long session here or forty minute session. Mm. I mean, what I, as you know, uh, and people listening to this webinar may know, I have been very out and about participating in training courses, mm. and the most valuable courses I think are not about only about the what, the what you need to do, but the why you need to do it. And I'm always quite taken aback when I stand in front of or give a webinar to technical managers and their responses when we do explain why and the impact, the personal impact mm -hmm. of um, allergen control has. So I think that's, that's a really, really uh, valid point. When people are thinking about training courses, it's not only the what. Um, One of the things... Lynn Lynn, one Sorry. of the things I found on your on your corporate conferences and it, that have been been absolutely excellent and really re reinforced it to to me and to others is when you have a, a parent of an allergenic child um, mm -hmm. talking and and they are a, they're not a, they're not a scientist they're not a food scientist they're not a food expert and they can relate this is why you do this mm. and it you're right you've you've got to get you've got to get it in here you've got to get if you can get why in here in your head that that really does reinforce it and it, it increases compliance. I'm going to squeeze, I've got several more questions here, <laughs> but I'm going to squeeze one more in. As I say, we will make sure that we pin Peter down and we do a full Q&A after this webinar that people can um, look at. But just one more, because I think this is, this is uh, really interesting. Do you think more research is needed around the science behind different allergen cleaning techniques and effective solutions detergents for removing allergens from different surfaces? Yes, I think more research is, is needed. Um, there are practical challenges um, with, with doing that because if you think about the matrix of, right, we may have half a different dozen different uh, materials of construction using the food industry commonly and food service commonly, fantastic. We then got a range of different recipes with a range of different allergens, with a range of different components, uh, so proportions of allergens in those in that, that mix. We then got the different cleaning methods from manual through to, to automatic. Um, we then got the range of different detergents you can use. If you start to put that into a big matrix, it's a very big matrix. Um, so there isn't at the moment an internationally agreed standard for what an allergen clean actually looks like there is work going on on that and a lot of work with gfsi is is looking at the cleanability um so yes i think there is there is more research needed uh certainly the the camden guideline 59 i mentioned there that's got the um the guy the, the validation of cleaning for allergens tackles a lot of that and i believe there'll be more um information coming through at the moment a lot of the research scientists are somewhat uh, somewhat diverted um onto onto other other topics <laughs> um but in all seriousness although other things certainly covid is, is taking a lot of people's time up at the moment certainly it's taken a hell of a lot of my time up we've also got to remember that the regular food safety is going on as well yeah you know, the bacteria haven't stopped growing the allergens haven't stopped uh, moving around we're still making and a lot of places are doing longer product runs with reduced cleaning windows so it needs careful management and control we are almost out of time so i will very very quickly say thank you so much to peter for that fabulous webinar absolutely fantastic uh, explanation around the different areas um, as I say, the webinar will be available for people to look at through all our channels, our website. We'll also put it on Twitter and Facebook so people have an opportunity to look at it later um, and pass it on. The presentation and the excellent accompanying paper and the Q&A will all be available to corporate members, both through our corporate newsletter and also on the corporate section of our website. Um, so with that, with that, all I can say is thank you so much, Peter, for that excellent, excellent webinar. Absolute pleasure, Lynn, and thank you for all the work that you and the campaign team do. Thank you. Very much appreciated. And thank you to everyone for listening. Thank you.